Jesus is speaking, and he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures, and said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem, and ye are witnesses of, those, witnesses of those things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye. Pay particular attention. Tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. In other words, tarry simply means stay. Don't go anywhere. Just stay where you are until you are endued with power. And he led them out as far as to Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. Came to pass, while he blessed them, he was parted from them, carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for its infallible truths, our commands that you give to us. And Lord, we pray today, I pray today, not only for my own self, but for every member of this church, that we, we, we will strive to be obedient to your word. Help us, Lord to be filled with your spirit, and to do as you instruct us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. The context here is Jesus is expounding on the events of his life, including his death and his resurrection. He goes on to tell his disciples that they've been chosen to carry the gospel throughout all the world to the regions beyond. We find, we find this teaching, which is called the Great Commission, in Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20, where Jesus said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of of the world. After this, he tells them to wait at Jerusalem to be endued or given, to be given power from heaven. Then Jesus ascends back to glory. However, a few days after Jesus ascended, his disciples find themselves still in this world. They're scared, they're, they're hunted, and they have a big job ahead of them that needs to be done. These followers of Jesus, however, took Jesus seriously, and they did return to Jerusalem, and they waited for Jesus to fill them with his spirit. When he did, they went into all the world. They touched it for the Lord. They made such an impact that they were accused in Acts 17, 6 of turning the world upside down, and literally they did in their part of the world. They turned it upside down. They were able to accomplish uh, these great things because they did what Jesus told them to do. If we would learn to do what Jesus tells us to do, our lives would be more beneficial to others, more profitable to ourselves, if we would just learn to do what he says to do. They tarried, they stayed until he empowered them. Now here we are 2,000 years later and we are organized, we have a nice building, we have music, we have lights, we have air conditioning, we have complete copies of God's word and there are preachers who've studied the word. We have everything that we need to impact the world for Jesus except for one thing that will get the job done and that's the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of God. Why do we not have this power working in and through the church because many have never carried out this command in their lives. Many have never tarried until they were endued 
And then there are some who tarry on and on and on and on, staying forever and never moving off square one. That's another problem. Therefore, I believe the greatest need for our churches, if not for the whole world, is for a church that's filled with God's spirit and endued with power from above. Uh, this, this evening, I'd like to focus for a few minutes on these verses, particularly verse uh, 49, and speak to you for just a few minutes on this subject, tarry until. Verse 49 says, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem till you are endued with power from on high. We have in John 14, 25, the entrance of the Comforter. The Holy Spirit was promised, and the Holy Spirit was given. In John 14 and verse 25, uh, Jesus said, He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. The Father which sent me. Jesus had promised his disciples only days earlier that God would send his spirit and, and his comforter into the world. The promise was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost. And my, how we need God's comforter in our lives. Amen. We need his comfort and his comforting spirit in our lives above anything else. Uh, as a result of the Holy Spirit coming the disciples were able to carry out the great commission that's given to us in, in Acts 1, 8, where uh, we read this. Acts 1, 8 says, Ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. The Holy Spirit is given to every born-again believer. Every born-again believer is endued with the Holy Spirit at the moment he is saved. When I invited Jesus Christ into my life, he sent the Holy Spirit to dwell there. And he promised to dwell there forever. He said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. And today, 61 years later, he still abides there. Does he live in your heart? Does the Holy Spirit live and abide in your life? Do you sense his presence on a daily basis, on a moment-to-moment -moment basis perhaps? Every child of God possesses the Holy Spirit. If you have not that spirit, you have not God. You have not Jesus Christ. If we are to experience God's presence in our worship, both public and private, God's power in our witness and God's provision along the way, we may need to allow God to do all he wants to do in and through us. We are, I think we withhold ourselves from the will of God so many times. There are times God wants to use us. God may lay someone or something upon your heart that you need to contact, that you may need to minister to, and you, you rebuff that spirit. You put it off. I'll do it another time. Don't do that. When God speaks to you, respond. Respond immediately. It may be very, very urgent. I learned years ago, when, some, when God lays somebody on my heart, deal with it now. Don't deal with it another day. It may involve a phone call. It may involve a visit. It may involve any number of things, but react, respond immediately to the, to the Spirit of God. Ephesians 5.18 should be and must be a reality in the life of Christians where he says, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Be filled. That is a command that we are given. We must continually be being filled with the Spirit. Now, we, the Spirit indwells us only one time. 
He comes in at the moment of salvation when, when I accepted Christ and when you accepted Christ and, and asked him to save your soul and he responded to your request. The Holy Spirit then came into your life. But he talks about many fillings. There are so many times that we have an opportunity to be filled with the Spirit and we don't allow it. We don't want it. Why do we not want to be filled with the Spirit? Because we already have made up our minds what we're going to do in certain situations. And I don't want, to inter I don't want God interfering with me. I don't want that. I'm going to do what I'm going to do no matter what. God stay out of this. Now, that's pretty blunt, pretty plain, but it's the truth, and you know it. I did that for a long time until he whittled me down to size time after time after time. And he chopped my legs out from under me a few times, and I learned that God meant what he said. When he says, be filled with the Spirit, let the Spirit lead you, and be obedient to my word, God means it. Now, unsaved people can get, get away with a lot. But if you are a born-again believer, you can't get away with much. God will take care of you. He'll send illness into your home. He'll send illness to you. He'll put you in what we call an accident. God has his ways. God has his ways. And sometimes we don't recognize them, and I believe that God many times is working directly in, in situations to gain our attention and for us to realize this is because of disobedience this thing that's come upon me. So we're to tarry until God's promise is revealed. We are to, uh, well, let me just say this. Being filled with the Spirit, nothing is full until there's no room for anything else. Follow that thought? Nothing is full until it's there's not room for anything else. If you take a glass of cloudy water, a little bit muddy, you can't continue to pour water in it and make that water clear. What do you have to do? You have to empty it, dump it, and then start all over again. Fill it. That's what God wants us to do as Christians. He wants us to quit messing around and puttering around with sin and unfaithfulness. He wants us to acknowledge him and take his word. He wants to fill us with his spirit. And in order for us to be filled with the spirit, we need to empty ourselves. Empty ourselves. Dear Lord, cleanse my heart, cleanse my mind. I'll do what you say. Lord, even if I don't, even if it's something I don't want to do, I will do my best to be obedient to you. Life is so much simpler. Life is so much easier. Life is so much more pleasant. Life is so much more peaceful when there is nothing between my soul and the Savior. <clears throat> There's a good song. I believe it's in our hymnal. Nothing between my soul and the Savior. Now, many times we let things come between us and him in fact, there's not a day goes by that I don't have to get alone with God and confess sins in thought, in word, in deed, and let him fill me with his spirit. As long as those sins go unconfessed, there's dirt in my life. There's dirt. He can't use me while it's there. So tarry until God's promise is revealed tarry until God's power is revealed. The source of this power in ourselves, we're weak, can't do anything. Do you realize that? Without God, you are totally powerless. Do we understand that? God is the source of your next breath. He's the source of your next heartbeat. He can stop it at any moment. Romans 7.18 says, Romans 7.18 says, For I know that in me, 
that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. I find not. In other words, without him, we're helpless. We're helpless. I hope that, I hope that at some point you've recognized that. You've acknowledged that. Try to acknowledge that every day. Lord, I'm yours today. Whatever, whatever you want me to do, that's exactly what I'll best do with your help. I'll do it with your help. I'll do it. Not I'll try to do it or I'll think about doing it. God, with your help, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. That's what he said. Uh, any power in any person is the result of God's indwelling and his infilling. Philippians 14 tells, that we, tells us that we can do all things through Christ. Not, not, I'm not strong simply because I know him, and I know him. I am only strong when I allow Jesus to have his will and his way in my life. In uh, Ephesians 3, turn there if you will, please, for a moment. Ephesians 3 and verse 20. Ephesians 3 and verse 20 says, Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to his power that worketh in us, unto him, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Sometimes we, we think we've done something special or we give great acclaim to somebody that we think has done something special. We have musicians and they're Sometimes we consider them fantastic, and they are. Where did they get that talent? God gave it to them. Amen. Glorify God. Yeah, it's all right to say, hey, you did a good job. But let's not swoon over human beings. God is the source of everything that's good. Amen. Jonathan Edwards. How many of you recognize that name? Jonathan Edwards. If you never heard that name, you've missed a great preacher. <clears throat> he preached the famous sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Jonathan Edwards was a man who was almost blind. He had a shrill voice, high-pitched, not pleasant to look at. He had a great impact on New England in the 1700s. Ripple effects are felt and heard all over the world today. I have a copy of his sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. 500, listen to this, 500 were saved in one service where Jonathan Edwards preached. That was without TV, that was without radio, that was eyeball to eyeball. And he preached. He, he, he was not, not the handsomest. He was not the greatest orator. He was not, uh, not, not one who could preach loud or just rambunctious. But he was the one who allowed the Spirit of God to lead him. The Spirit of God is it, not about the greatest orator. It's not about the greatest Bible student. It's not about the one who can preach the loudest or have the most uh, entertaining sermon. It's about the one that God fills with his spirit who gets the job done and who God will bless. And you know how before he preached that sermon where 500 were saved, you know what happened? A few people in the town where it was preached spent the entire night in prayer for their community. Spent the night in prayer for their community before John Edward, Jonathan Edwards preached his, by most people's standards, it would be sort of a feeble attempt to preach. Couldn't see. He could barely, and he preached it like this. Yet 500 people came to know Christ because of the Spirit of God was upon him. 
So it's not the person. It's the Spirit of God. To God be the glory. Great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son. There's no limit to the power of Almighty God. He has the ability to do whatever needs to be done at whatever time it needs to be done. In Matthew 28 and verse 18, I'm going to read you a verse. 28, 18. Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. He can soften the hardest of hearts. He can lift the greatest burdens. His power is um, unlimited. He is omnipotent. He's omnipresent. He's omniscient. He's God Almighty. God Almighty. We still have a New Testament God who's able to do what he did in days past. The problem today is not with God. It's with us. It's with his people. God can and will send revival, but he will send them on his terms. You know what his terms are? We've ignored them. And here's God's terms for revival. Listen to this. Listen. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray. How much time have you spent in prayer in the last 24 hours? Hey, I'm talking to you. And you. How much time have you spent in prayer? If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then, and I'll insert a little phrase there, and not until then, will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Then you know what God does? I believe God extends that ultimatum. Then I believe he's, he sits down and folds his arms and he writes 15, verse 15 where he said, Now my eyes shall be open, my ears attent unto the prayer that's made this place. He said, here's the formula for revival. Now let's see what you do with it. What are we going to do with it? We go just keep on going, doing the same things we've always done, just showing up at 10 o'clock and 11 o'clock and 7 o'clock and going through the motions, or are we going to let God have his way? We're going to let God. Not, not, not talking about somebody else. Talking to our, I'm talking to me. And then as pastor, I'm talking to you. We each have a responsibility to let God have his way in our life, to spend time in prayer, to seek his face, allow him to minister to us, that we, in turn, can minister to others. <clears throat> the Christian is not able within himself. He has no ability to minister anybody unless he's filled with the Spirit of God. Am I filled with the Spirit? Got to tell you, not always. Sometimes the flesh overcomes me. <clears throat> Sometimes I get angry. Sometimes I get offended. Sometimes I want to lash out. <clears throat> That's the fleshly nature. See, you do too. But we overcome that by letting the Holy Spirit fill us with His presence. Then he can use you. He cannot use you in that state where you are not filled with his spirit. Can't use you. He won't use you. You'll be a detriment to the cause of Christ when you're in that state. Almost brought a message this evening entitled, Can Others See Jesus in Me? I think that's important. Can others see Jesus in me, in my daily walk, daily life? 
What do they see in me? Do they see a Christian who is yielded to the will of God? A Christian who is who is who attempts to does the very best he can to walk in the center of God's will? Or does he see someone who does his own thing and gives God his spare time? What does he see? What do others see when they see you and what's your life? The word power, we talk about the scope of his power. Uh, and uh, his formula, his uh, prescription for revival. The word power comes from the word dunamis, which is the ability to perform anything. And this is, this is the power that works in every child of God. We get our words dynamite and dynamic from that word dunamis. Teaches us that we are indwelt by his spirit that his power lives within us. And when it's needed, it will explode from us and work into the world. If you let him use you. If I let him use me. We need this power. We need this power. We need it in this church. Souls are perishing all around us due to the lack of the power of God in our lives. Sin is rampant in our society because there's no manifest of the, of the presence and power of God among his people. I'm not talking about the outside world. I'm talking about the folks in the inside of these walls. Yeah, you're good people. You're good people, but the Spirit of God needs to be overflowing from our lives. And we need to, for people to see in us something that they desire, something that they want, something they realize is different than what they are. Power. Power is available. But it's not revealed because fear of paying the price in prayer and faithless to God. Few are yielding their lives to God. Seek ye first. First the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things, all these other things that we chase after will be added unto you. The secret of his power isn't getting more of God. You got all of him when you were saved. The secret is giving more of yourself to him. He wants more of you. You have, you have all of him. We read, we talk about what God did 200, 150 years ago. And I'm glad he did. I'm hungry to see it again. And yes, I've seen... I've seen what I called revival back 40, 50 years ago. I've never seen it many times, but I'm hungry to see it now. Oh, I long to see it now. Some of you probably have never experienced it and you don't really know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about when Christian people's hearts are broken because of the lost people around them, lost relatives, lost Husbands, lost wives, lost neighbors, lost co-workers. And they spend hours praying and praying, having cottage prayer meetings and gathering up in certain places, praying for revival in their hearts and in their community. Oh, how we need the power of God back in our lives again. We're paying the price in our world today for the lack of yieldedness to the power of God. I sincerely believe that our country is in the state it's in because of the failure of Christian people to do what God tells us to do. I'm hungry to see Christ adored and worshiped as he deserves. And I, I believe that the key to revival is prayer. Prayer and submission of oneself to God. Uh, I'd love to experience the awesome power of God as I've seen in days past. He's the same God today that he's always been. He's not changed. We've changed. 
You've changed. I've changed. We're different. Uh, the, the, the character of God's plan, it involves tarrying. We are prone to run off half-cocked and do things in the flesh. And we don't know where we're going or what we're doing. Now that's true whether you believe it or not, or whether you like it. Terry means to sit down, just sit down, cool it. Pray. Seek God's will. Seek God's face. Jesus told his disciples to sit down until they were filled. How do they spend the ten days between the, that command and the filling of the Holy Spirit? They spent them praying in Acts, the first chapter. They were waiting on God to fill them for service. Too many of us are willing to tarry, but for the wrong reason. We're lazy. So Jesus is not talking about that kind of tarry. He said, wait for directions from me and then go get them. Evangelist Charles Finney was always preceded. Charles Finney was a great, great preacher. You've all heard of Charles Finney, I'm sure. Always a great preacher. And always the week before Finney went to preach in a revival, uh, Daniel Nash went ahead of him. You know what Daniel Nash did? Did he preach? Did he have permit? No. He came to town three or four weeks ahead of Finney. He got a hotel room. He holed up and he prayed. That's all he did. Just got him a room and, went and got alone and he prayed to God for revival. He seldom, seldom ever went to the services. He stayed in a hotel and he prayed during the services. After Nash died, within four months, Finney stopped holding revival services and became a pastor where he didn't have anything to do. That's supposed to be funny. Finney didn't have the same success without Daniel Nash and his prayers. We need to pray. Pray for your pastor. Pray for other pastors. Pray for people who are proclaiming the gospel of God's grace. Pray for Samaritan's Purse. Pray for people like that doing a great work. Pray. I held a meeting in 1976 in Madison, North Carolina, which is the home of the Hoppers. It wasn't, it wasn't the Hoppers back then. It was Hopper Brothers and Connie. It was the Hopper Brothers and Connie played the piano. And I held a meeting there in the Good News Baptist Church for a man named Cecil Wright. <laughs> now, you know I'm not a very good preacher. You know that. But boy, the people just started coming forward and coming forward and getting saved and getting saved. And I couldn't believe it. I mean, I knew my messages were weak and I was a, not a very formidable preacher. But I couldn't explain it. Then I found out why that was happening. There was a group of men and women in the basement of that church during those meetings and they were praying while I was preaching. Yeah, praying while I was preaching. I didn't even know they were there. I didn't know who they were. But I found out they were downstairs lifting me up to God. Went to Lewisburg in 1971 to Calvary Baptist Church with Brother Charlie Pollock. Brother Charlie had asked Preacher Jimmy to come there and hold a meeting. And Jimmy said, well, I'm busy that week. Get Jerry to come. Charlie said, well, I don't want Jerry I want you. Jimmy said, well, take it or leave it. So finally Charlie called me and asked me to come, and I, I didn't know about the previous conversation. I'd have probably said no. But, but I went, and I walked into that church that night, and it was just like electricity in that, in that building. And I could hear people over in this room praying. I could hear people over in this room praying. And, boy, that's like saying sick him to a dog, you know. It set my soul on fire. People responded. People, people came from everywhere. Every night we had 12, 15, as many as 20 people at the altar. 
I saw revival. Revival. There was a small church, probably 200 people. At the end of that meeting, I stayed over an extra day on a Sunday afternoon to help Brother Charlie baptize 52 people. 52 people. Why? Because people prayed. I believe that with all my heart. People prayed and prayed and prayed. And God moved. And God is still moving. <clears throat> in, in, even in that church, that Calvary Baptist Church at that time is now the big Lewisburg Baptist Church that sits up on the hill behind Hardy's, I believe it is. Or no, Walmart someplace. I know where it is. But it's a very big church now. But I saw, the, I saw the power of prayer. Before we amount to much, we're going to have to pray. We're going to have to acknowledge that God is supreme. I'm not supreme. You're not supreme. God is the answer to everything. And we get what we need from him. From him. The cost of God's plan simply boils down to a matter of priorities. What's more important to you? Those things that you love so much or the power of God? Which is more important? You have to answer that for yourself. When the disciples were willing to tarry before the Lord, they were rewarded with his power. They changed their world through the power of God in their lives. This church, in this church, we can see God move right here in this church and in our lives. We can see sinners saved. We can see homes restored. We can see lives reclaimed. We can experience the power of God in our services. We can experience God's conviction among the hearts of those who come to our church if we are willing to pay the price to see it happen. If we're willing to pay the price. That, my friend, is the problem. Have you ever tarried before the face of God until he filled you with his power? Have you wrestled in prayer? Have you in the wee hours of the morning gotten up and knelt down beside your bed and prayed, oh God, oh God, this burden in my heart, please take it away. God, help me. God, help me. Have you ever done that? Do you know what that's like? To spend few hours just wrestling with God as Jacob in Genesis said I won't turn you loose until you bless me are you guilty as I've often been of being too busy to pray that's too busy if you're too busy to pray my friend you're too busy <clears throat> I'm asking you this week to pray. Ask God's blessing upon yourself and upon your home and upon your pastor and upon the church, upon those that are important to you. We're a needy people. But the one thing that we need most is the very thing that what God wants to give us most, and that's his power. Let him have his way in your life. Now this... This was not intended to be a sermon. This is intended to be a lesson. Just a simple lesson about how to, re how to receive the favor of God. Surrender.